So if you look at the blue insert in your order of service, you can take notes on this morning's message as well as use this week's Grow, Pray, Study Guide. If you look at the top of the page there, you'll see three blanks. Here's what I invite you to do. Think about three words or phrases that describe your father. So take a moment to either jot that down or think about that. Three words or phrases that you would use to describe your dad. Go ahead and tell a person beside you at least one of those three, and if it's your dad, make sure it's the good one. Take a moment to do that. Here's why I asked that question. I read this book, What Makes a Man? I read this book 25 years ago. There's one long paragraph in here that changed my paradigm for being a dad. So let me read that to you. Uh, it's the one thing I remember. It was a good book, but it's the one thing I remember from this book. Uh, Ken Canfield writes this. A friend of mine tells me of a theology class he took years ago in seminary where on the first day of the semester, the professor handed out a personal questionnaire. Many of the questions on the survey had to do with the student's perceptions of his father and the relationship he had with him. The surveys were collected and no more was said of it. The students forgot all about them during the rigorous months of studying about the first person of the Trinity, his attributes, his work, and his words. At the end of the course, the professor handed out a second survey. This time, the students were supposed to honestly record their perceptions of God and feelings about their relationship with him. The questions, in fact, were the same as those on the first survey they took, but redirected toward the Heavenly Father, not the earthly ones. Here's the sentence that hit me. When the professor returned both sets of surveys, including the previously forgotten one, the students were astounded that even after a whole semester of studying about God, they still had trouble differentiating him relationally with their earthly dads. That terrified me. That, that motivated me. That, that drives me still to try to be a good dad to my two daughters. Now, look at the three words or phrases you thought of or wrote down. If you were to take those words and phrases about your earthly dead, would they apply to your heavenly father? For example, my, generous describes my dead. That's one word I would write down. My, my dad is the most generous person I know. And when I think of God, our heavenly father, I see him as a generous God. If your dad was the rule enforcer, you, you might see God as the judge. If your dad abandoned you, and I'm sorry that he did, you, you may see God as, as distant. You may find it difficult to pray to your heavenly father. If your dad demonstrated sacrificial love, you probably understand the beauty of the sacrifice our heavenly father made in sending Jesus. Today we look at fantastic fathers with this idea to, to raise the value of fathers. And we look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Would you join me in reading this verse together? Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So we get ready to dig into this idea of, of raising the value of fathers. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we celebrate Father's Day... We thank you that you are our Father. In your grace and care, you are the Father to the fatherless. You are perfect, holy, and loving. Meet us, Lord, as we bring a multitude of backgrounds and experiences with our earthly fathers. Remember this day those who rejoice and those who hurt. We give thanks that you are with us throughout all of life. For fathers who serve and sacrifice, who comfort and live courageously, who give grace and point us to you, we find it easy to give thanks for fathers who are selfish, have abandoned and abused their children, and avoided their responsibility. We ask for freedom from bitterness, forgiveness for failure, and your hand to guide them as the fathers you want them to be, and our world needs them to be. For those who became fathers for the first time this year, fill their hearts with joy and their bodies with rest. May the joy of birth be followed with your power to follow through with love and parenting. For those who lost fathers this year, 
We ask for your comfort and peace, for happy memories and resolution to past failures. Thank you for your forgiveness and your love. For those who long to be fathers and grandfathers, but issues of marriage, infertility, miscarriage, and life not happening on our time, we ask for your peace and presence in the pain and your plan and purpose for the present and future life. For foster dads, mentor dads, and spiritual dads, we thank you for their wisdom and praise you for their love we need. For single moms, who too often have to play the role of mom and dad, we pray for father role models to influence and engage the lives of children, to show what you mean for a dad to be. For fathers who will become empty nesters in the year ahead, we pray for great memories and moments that will launch their child into the future and fulfill their joy in this new season of parenting. For those waiting new life and the joy of being a father next year, we pray for a healthy birth in the year ahead and great celebration next Father's Day. And Heavenly Father, as an imperfect earthly father, I ask for your forgiveness that we all need and pray for your wisdom and grace to point our children and all children of all ages to know you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love in Jesus. And when the storms come in our parenting, turn our eyes to Jesus so that we can lead all our families to know and praise him. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Today we're going to look at the need for fantastic fathers. In some sense, this is a message about parenting, whether you're a fantastic father or a magnificent mother. Uh, there's some observations I'm just going to share that I've discovered about parenting. Now, if you're not a parent, at this point, you may want to check out of the message. I want to invite you to check back in because uh, the observations I'm going to share, in many ways, you can apply to developing deep relationships. So uh, if father or mother's not your deal, uh, think of a friend. Think of how this truth might apply to them. Th think of the difference that it can make. And, and I recognize I, I, that if you follow this 100% what I'm going to say, I can't guarantee how your kids are going to turn out. There are people who, who do the three observations, I say, who do them much better than I do. And yet they find themselves with rebellious children. And, and people often carry a boatload of guilt. And, and really that's why we looked at the parable of the, of the prodigal son. Because the image, the father image in that parable is our heavenly father. And did you notice how messed up those two kids are? You got one son who basically says, Dad, drop dead so I can get the money now, and then goes off and blows it. He eventually comes back. Then you have the good son who stays at home, but at the end of the story, he's mad at Dad. He's kind of outside the family relationship, and there can't be a more perfect father than our heavenly father, and even his children rebel. So if your kids haven't turned out to that kind of spot where you thought them, where you thought even God wanted them to be, don't, don't beat yourself up with guilt this morning. Embrace the gift of grace that God gives. And don't give up on your kids either. Continue praying for them. They may be taking the long road home like the younger son did. Or they may just need to, to have a few experiences in life where God begins to shape and mold them to be his child. Now, I still find great value, even with, with kind of all those things, I still find great value in these three observations. Uh, the first one will just reduce friction in any relationship. The second one will provide some, some great traction. And the third one is the ultimate example of power. So let's start with the first one. Uh, fill your child's love bucket to overflowing. In the parable of the prodigal son, the, the youngest son basically says, Dad, I wish you were dead so I could get my share of the inheritance now. And Dad, amazingly, cashes out about a third of the property the family owns gives the money to the kid, the village would say foolishly that they live in, and the, the kid runs off with, without even saying thank you, Dad. He goes off and he kind of just blows it all. And he finds himself bankrupt. He finds himself in a famine situation. He finds himself feeding pigs, and the pigs are eating better than he is. And then he comes to his senses. He starts heading home. Look at the father's response when his young son returns home here in Luke 15, verse 20. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now, we kind of understand that. That kind of fits our culture. If you haven't seen your child for a long time and they're coming, you kind of run to embrace them. That, that makes sense to us. But in that culture, 
That, that just would not happen. A man of this stature never runs. And he doesn't go to you. You come to him. So, so why would he do that? And, and running like that, he is hurting his social standing in the community. But what he is doing is he's sacrificing his reputation to protect his son from criticism from the village. And that's part of filling a love bucket, especially if you're a dad. You make sacrifices to fill somebody else's love bucket. Dennis Rainey heads up this ministry called Family Life, and Dennis and his wife Barbara have six children. I was in a conference once, and, and somebody asked Dennis Rainey, well, what lesson have you learned having six kids in your home? And his response was, I learned to sacrifice a little bit more each day by having six kids in my home. There is sacrifice in loving. Our Heavenly Father knows that. Our Heavenly Father who sends His Son, Jesus, shows sacrificial love. Th think about Jesus. God the Father sends His Son into the world knowing that the very people He came to save will, will reject Him. Even His 12 closest followers, one, one will betray Him, the other 11 will abandon Him. He will die a brutal death for our sins. And yet the worst moment for father and son is that moment when Jesus bears the sins of the whole world and cries out, my God, my God, what, why have you forsaken me? Knowing all that, God the Father sends his son into this world. Sacrificing is part of being a father. A fantastic father's willingly sacrifice. Sometimes it's going to work. Sometimes it's going to work to a job they, they don't really love. But they know they need to provide for their families. Sometimes sacrificial love is coming home from work, even from a job you love. And all you want to do is kind of veg out in front of the TV. And instead of me time, you invest in we time to build relationships uh, in the family. Now, if you think that sacrificial love is, is the only part of filling a love bucket, there's much more to it. There's celebration as well. Oh, look what the father does when the son comes back here in verses 22 through 24. The father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Sacrificial love paves the way for great celebrations. That's what we do in worship. We celebrate the sacrifice that Jesus made. That's what brings us together. That he paid for our sins that we might be part of God's family. Celebrations are part of, of filling a love bucket. My dad taught me that uh, the official love language for the Berkey family is food. But some of us have different dialects. My daughter Dana in high school, she loved to make this dish called Mediterranean pizza. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Lo loaded with garlic, onions, and artichokes. Three of my least favorite ingredients to have in large quantities, and two of them in any quantity. I never worried about her dating in high school. Eating that much kind of garlic and onion, no, no boy was coming near that girl. And she would make that. And so I, I it wasn't my favorite meal. I thought I kind of hid that, but when I told her I was going to tell the story this week, and she goes, oh yeah, you really didn't like that one, did you, Dad? Uh, usually it was grudgingly, occasionally it was gracefully. But I, I wanted to express love to my daughter. Th th think of, of your kids or think of your friends. What, what fills their love bucket? Where do you make a sacrifice? Where, where do you find a, a time of celebration? Now, the third observation happens automatically. The first one, kind of the easiest one. The second one uh, is the most challenging. Build boundaries with right-sized discipline. A, a lost art in our day is, is knowing when to let your kids fail. The dad in Luke 15 doesn't seem to have a problem with that one. He, he, uh, he lets his young son fail. Uh, look how the story unfolds here in verses 12 through 14 of Luke 15. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered wealth and wild living. 
After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. Now, though the English translation says he divided the estate, the literal translation would be he divided his life. His bios is the actual word. He divided his life. Can you feel the pain in those words? This dad had to know that by giving his son this large chunk of cash, that this was a doomed venture. And yet he does. He's willing to let his son go out there. He's willing to see what will happen. And he's willing to embrace when his his son comes uh, home as well. I was listening to a podcast on leadership, and they were interviewing a businessman in Atlanta. And one of the questions was, what, what's changed in the last 10, 15, 20 years in terms of uh, college graduates applying for businesses? And the guy said, well, now we offer a job to the college graduate. Instead of just the graduate talking to us, his or her mom comes and interviews us to make sure that we are the right place for their son or daughter to work. Really? That, that, what, what, when do you, when do you kind of launch them? What, when are they kind of uh, uh, on their own? What, what, when do they get to handle that? Our kids had chores growing up, and our oldest daughter, Laura, her chore was vacuuming the house once a week. Uh, and the deal was, if you don't have the house vacuumed by Friday night, you don't go out with your friends. I, th- I think we argued about five times more in length of time for Laura to vacuum the house than the time it would take Laura to vacuum the house. It, it just was crazy. Sharon's, I think, absolute favorite phone call is a message that was on our answering machine, and it said, Mom, thank you for teaching me chores. Thank you for making me vacuum. She was living in an apartment off campus with some other uh, classmates, and uh, one of them was not doing chores. One of them even did not know how to run a, a vacuum cleaner. She had just never done that in her whole life. And she just thanked Sharon for that opportunity uh, to do that. Now, what's interesting with this father is, you've, so you've got the young son who's kind of rebellious and goes away, and the older son, kind of the good son, stays home. But at the end of the story, the, the older son, uh, he turns against his father as well. Dad throws this party to welcome the young son home. The older son hears about it. And did you notice how he described his dad? His perception of dad is as a cheap slave driver who doesn't love him. And notice how the father ma- maintains a, a level of love for both sons, but also a standard of discipline. Look what it says here in verses 31 and 32. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now parents, soon to be parents, hope to be parents, I hate to break it to you. When I was going to school, there was a line of thought that said, children are a blank slate when they enter this world. And you are the one that gets to determine how they turn out. That's not true. If you read the Bible carefully, if you observe humanity at all, you begin to discover that only Jesus was the sinless one. The rest of us enter this world with a sinful, selfish nature. Consider the wisdom of Proverbs 22, verse 15. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. Now, that's not a license for parents, but, and especially for fathers to beat their children, but it is an invitation to right-size your discipline. There was a time for our kids, you may not approve of this, but we did. We, we spanked our kids. That was just one form of discipline. It wasn't the only form. There were timeouts, there was a loss of privileges, or there was giving up privileges if you followed the rules and did your chores and all that good stuff. It was interesting, in Laura's case, all her friends knew that she had to have the house vacuumed by Friday. They would start to yell at her, Laura. You know you got to do this all week. Would you just vacuum so we can go out? And that's fine how that happened. The, the challenge of these first two observations is, is kind of finding the right mix. 
Think of it this way. So in the first observation with, with love that overflows the kid's bucket or your friend's bucket, th think of it as running water, as a river flowing. And then think of, of discipline. With your friends, you should use the word accountability. Friends don't really like to be disciplined. Sometimes they do like to be held accountable. Uh, think of that as riverbanks. And so if you have, have the water of love flowing and discipline is the riverbanks, there, there is great power as that water flows. The first observation of love, it, it, it reduces friction. But, but with a path of discipline that, that brings out the best in your child that God has put in there, that, that provides great tr traction for, for deep relationships. Now, no matter what you do with the first two, the third one always applies. The greatest power is the power of example. Uh, observation three, be the example God needs you to be. Be the example God needs you to be, whether good or bad. They will do what, what they see you do. Uh, even for a young son who told his dad, look, I wish you were dead so I could get my money. Even he realizes, begins to put together uh, in a desperate situation that his dad treated his employees well. Oh, look at how he puts it here in verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. He didn't remember dad's fathering skills, but he did remember how dad treated employees. And so that memory drove him to look for dad's compulsion, or compassion. Now, both my daughters graciously this past week affirmed that I'm a loving, caring dad and uh, we all get along. Uh, but one of them told me a couple years ago, she said, you, you were really hard as a dad. She was saying, look, your, your, your discipline hand was a lot stronger than your love hand. What she didn't know, it could have been worse. The best parenting advice I ever got came from Sharon. Uh, we were at dinner one night, and uh, since we were all together, all around the table, and at this point in our lives, everybody was going their own way, uh, I thought, there were some discipline issues we needed to deal with, and we're all here, so we'll deal with it now. And uh, so I did. And then after dinner, after the girls had gone up to their room, uh, Sharon graciously and directly painted a, a picture of what she thought dinner should be like. She said, when we have dinner, I want that to be a place where, where we all want to come. I want that to be a place where uh, we have deep conversation. And then she just asked a series of questions. Did you notice how quiet the girls became after you talked? Did you notice how little they ate? Did you notice how quickly they asked to be excused from the table? Did you notice how little I ate? Did you notice how little you ate? Did you notice how you felt as the mood around our dinner table changed? Best advice I ever got. Incredible wisdom. We're an amusement park family, and so if we have tickets to go to an amusement park, we're there. And, and we discovered waiting in line became holy ground because we learned the art of conversation. We, we learned to block out time for dinner. We redeemed our schedule. We, we just blocked out that time. Uh, the TV was off. We didn't answer the phone if it rang. If, if it, we, had, we had an answer machine, so if it was an emergency, we answered. If it was anything else and it could wait till after dinner, we, we waited. Our kids had these little electronic devices. They were supposed to be like electronic pets, and you had to push the buttons to feed them and put them down for a nap and walk them and all that good stuff. They, they were not allowed at the table. If it was today, it'd be like cell phones are set to quiet, or I call it stun mode myself, and put in another spot. It, you, you need to build in some face-to-face -face time. Whether it's with family or with friends, I notice this in restaurants. I go, you've got four people who I'm guessing are friends, and they're all looking like this. It's an invitation to have deep conversation, to, to grow. Now, with these three observations, I'm not an expert in this area. I'm a practitioner for almost 32 years, so I do have some experience to talk about, but I'm not an expert in this area. I also recognize that uh, in this message, I may have hit some buttons. Maybe if you're a dad, it hit some buttons. Maybe if your dad was good or bad, it hit some buttons. And maybe, maybe your dad passed away recently. And there I might have tapped some buttons as well. 
And yet, I would invite you today, no matter how good or bad your dad was, to to be able to make that leap to see how great our Heavenly Father is. And if your earthly father didn't fulfill that, or if your earthly father has passed, I think of how great our Heavenly Father is. Look what it says here in Psalm 68, verse 5. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in His holy dwelling. His abundant love, His right-sized discipline is always there for you and for me to grow. His example is always the perfect example. He is indeed our good, good Father. A fatherhood is not a sprint, but a marathon. And in the marathon, there's a part of the race that's called Heartbreak Hill. It's a part where your body just wants to stop. If you're going to drop out in the race, it's probably at this point. But if you push through, you can make it to the finish line. Heartbreak Hill for me as a parent was when my kids were ages 13 to 15 and a half. Both of them. I kind of expected it with the older one. The younger one kind of surprised me based on her personality. It, I felt distant. I felt discouraged. I felt like I was failing as a father. And still I tried to pour in love. I ate Mediterranean pizza out the eardrum. I don't know why it would come out there, but it really didn't like going down in here, so it was going somewhere. Um, I prayed. I just held on. And I don't know where you are with your kids or with your friends. But, but I invite you to hold on, to not let go. I'm, I'm glad I did. Uh, uh, my daughters and I, we get along better now than any point in our lives together. We really enjoy being together. This is from a Father's Day card they sent uh, about 10 years ago, just a fun card that made me feel like I'd made it as a father. Uh, and the grand prize? The grand prize is they have a strong faith in Jesus. That's, that's because they had a magnificent mother and me as their father and a wonderful church family that poured into them and a very good church they're a part of right now. Not as good as ours, but a very good church. And there's been some other kind of prize along the way. Turns out we got a son-in-law on the, the deal, and that led to a granddaughter, which is the reason you let your kids survive through childhood so you can have grandchildren, it turns out, so you can embrace joy once again. And here's the deal. I, I pray that you and I recognize the value of fantastic fathers and that we lift that up and affirm it because they, they, they raise incredible children who can change this world. And whether you've had a fantastic father or you would maybe say failure as a father, be the one of this generation that points your friends and family to how great our Heavenly Father is. For God is a father. And through faith in Jesus, He is your Father. And God, your Heavenly Father, throughout all your life, here on earth and in heaven, will show you His abundant love. Will right-size His discipline here on this earth. And will be the example that can transform your life and through your life, transform the lives of others. We bow our heads to pray. Our Heavenly Father, You are the fantastic Father. You fill our love bucket to overflowing, provide right-sized discipline as needed, and are a powerful example of how to parent, how to be a friend. Our Heavenly Father, we ask You to lead us to parent our children well and develop friendships that grow deeply. Our Heavenly Father, we praise You for Your great love in sending Jesus, who died for all our parenting sins, as well as all our other sins. You are our awesome God, and all God's people said, Amen.